Well, I've given up on the perfect Christmas. It's not possible. I can see the perfect Christmas over and over in my mind, but to create it in reality, it's impossible. It's impossible. You, you know what I'm talking about. You have dreamed it too. You spend hours and, and days preparing for the perfect Christmas, and then it gets all mucked up by the kids, the spouse, the in-laws, and the outlaws. One of my favorite holiday movies is Christmas Vacation, starring Chevy Chase and Beverly D'Angelo. The movie's really a parody about the false expectations that we build up around the traditional family Christmas experience. Most of us can identify with the character of Clark Griswold who does everything within his control to give his family the gift of the perfect Christmas. The movie begins with Clark taking his family into the wilderness in search of the perfect Christmas tree. After a road rage accident, which ends with the family station wagon crashing into a snowbank, the Griswolds set off into the wilderness on foot. And after a lengthy march in the snow, Clark finds the perfect Christmas tree, only to realize that he forgot the saw. From wrestling with strands of Christmas lights that won't work, to suffering with extended visits from abrasive relatives, the Griswolds continue to face experience that would prompt most of us to say, been there, done that. Folks, it's time to give up on the perfect Christmas. I have come to realize that my Christmases will never look like the Norman Rockwell paintings. Consumer-focused marketing and, and Victorian Christmas traditions have replaced the biblical meaning of God with us. In our attempts to create that magical Christmas experience, we run ourselves into the ground emotionally and physically and financially and relationally. Then after weeks of pressure and preparation, all for the purpose of creating one perfect day in an imperfect year, someone's upset because they didn't get the present they wanted, or a toy is already broken, or grandpa drank too much. And dad called grandma that B word. Oh, come on, you've had those Christmases. For many, the Christmas season is, is a reminder of those painful memories. A 30-something Christian man writes, The Christmas when my dad left our family was a pretty sad Christmas. I was about six years old. My aunts and extended family went out of their way to see we still had presents and a Christmas tree. While grateful for the gifts, it was not the presents or the tree that stuck in my mind, but the lesson I learned years later, that God can and will help you through those dark times of your life. Reverend Michael Slaughter, the author of Christmas is Not Your Birthday, writes this, Christmas may have brought the unexpected to your life this year. But even in the midst of the unexpected, even in the midst of the unexpected, God shows up. Sickness, death, divorce, unemployment, life gets messy. But in the midst of your mess, God shows up. No matter what you are struggling to overcome, no matter what life issues have come your way, God promises to show up. Christmas is God's vivid reminder that amid the uncertainty, God shows up to bring you peace and purpose and joy and hope and wholeness. We can give up on the perfect Christmas, but we should never give up on knowing that God is with us. That's why Jesus was called Emmanuel, God with us. It's Jesus that makes Christmas perfect. After all, Christmas is not your birthday. It's Jesus' birthday. Would you pray with me, please? Ah, oh, Lord God, in the midst of our imperfections, in the midst of all that we try to do to bring about that perfect Christmas, you did give us one perfect thing, and that was your son, Jesus Christ. And for that, we are thankful. 
And so, Lord, now I ask that you take these words of mine, mold them, shape them any way you wish, so that they become your words, both for our hearing and doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Christmas traditions have sanitized the Jesus birth announcement that you heard Don read in our scripture this morning. We've completely removed this event from its biblical and historical context. You see, the birth of Jesus was far from perfect. It was not sanitary. In fact, it was downright messy. Jesus was born in a stable, a cave, where animals were kept. And wherever there are animals, there is dung. And wherever there is dung, there are flies. And it didn't get much better from there. Jesus spent his, his earliest years as a refugee in Africa, escaping the genocide that Herod was committing in Judea against children aged two and under. Is this really the perfect Christmas? You see, both Mary and Joseph were descendants of King David, who had reigned over Palestine some 950 years earlier. The true royal succession of the Davidic throne had ended several centuries before when the Herods had taken over the throne by force. This is why Mary and Joseph were somewhat poor and lived in the district and poorest of towns called Nazareth. In fact, Nazareth is not even mentioned in the Old Testament. You see, nothing good ever came out of Nazareth. And if you trace the lines of Mary and Joseph and the Herods even farther back, you will find that Mary and Joseph were descendants of Jacob and the Herods were descendants of Esau. You remember them? Jacob and Esau, the twin boys that were born to Isaac. You see, these two tribes had been in battle for centuries. But now the angel Gabriel comes with good news. Well, let's say that he comes with shocking news. It involved a young girl who was betrothed, and a change in power was coming to the throne of David. Now in the sixth month, this is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, and you see Elizabeth was Mary's cousin and quite a bit older now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Once again, things are messy and complicated, far from perfect. By using the word virgin, Luke is describing a young girl who has yet to be with a man. Luke is, is describing this God miracle in the context of an unplanned teenage pregnancy with all of the emotional grief that that would entail. How emotionally prepared would a 12 to 14 year old girl be for this life experience? Would she really understand the idea of giving birth to the Son of God? Do not be afraid, Mary, Gabriel announces. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And then here comes the kicker. God predicted when Jacob and Esau were born that the older will serve the younger. The Lord God will give Jesus the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Did the thought at this time cross Mary's mind that her parents might not believe her explanation? The Holy Spirit got me pregnant? We already know that her fiancé, Joseph, rejected her early explanations in the Gospel of Matthew. You see, it's easy to make the first Christmas a perfect Christmas in our minds, but it wasn't that way at all. However, keep this in mind. Miracles never happen outside of the context of mystery and mess. The miracle of the Incarnation was no exception. However, it begins with what? The assurance of the angel's promise. Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. 
The first premise of faith, knowing that God is with you, that you are favored, and that God is the pursuer of our relationship with him, regardless of the circumstance, begins right there. The Lord is with you. The Christmas message is this. God not only came to us, but also is still here. Our prayers don't invite God's presence. Our prayers only recognize the reality that God is here and he's pursuing a relationship with each of us. The perfect Christmas is God with us. God with us. God says that we're highly favored. But brothers and sisters in Christ, please remember this. God's favor cannot be earned. God comes when we are doing everything wrong. God comes when we are doing nothing. God comes when we're naughty or nice. Why? Because God loves us and we are highly favored. But that doesn't mean that bad things will not happen. Slaughter writes this. Look at the situation from Mary's perspective. She had worked really hard to do what is right, yet it seemed like wrong still showed up. At the moment of the angel's visitation, Mary's limited theological understanding of the messianic promise would not have been at the forefront of her thinking. After all, how theologically astute could this adolescent be, Slaughter continues. He says, I am pretty sure that even after he was born, she had no grasp of who Jesus really was, what his ministry would entail, or what kind of pain she would later endure witnessing his suffering and execution. Likely the only thing on Mary's mind in that moment was, how will this be since I am a virgin? We have all had those how can this be moments. Maybe you have done everything you know to be both faithful to God and true to your families, and then you are notified four weeks before the holidays that your job will be discontinued at the end of the year, or your husband tells you that he doesn't love you anymore and wants a divorce, or your four-year-old is diagnosed with leukemia, or the high school guidance counselor calls and says he believes your son or daughter is using drugs. How can this be, God, when we have tried so hard to do what is right? Now imagine Mary trying to tell her parents that God did all of this. God's love and favor on us doesn't mean that the path of faith is going to be neat and predictable. Bad things happen to good people. Nowhere does the Bible promise that a life of faith will always make sense or follow a predictable path. God sent his son as a savior of the world, yet as a direct consequence of his birth, King Herod murdered untold numbers of babies under the age of two in an attempt to exterminate the king that he feared would take his throne. Or the 11th chapter of Hebrews, sometimes referred to as the Hall of Faith, celebrated righteous people throughout Scripture. What was the result of their faithfulness? They were tortured, killed, and some were sold in two. In 2 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul shares the results of his commitment to live faithfully. Listen to this. He says, Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Do any of us really understand what we're signing up for when we say yes to Jesus? The way the Western Church now celebrates Christmas has strayed quite far from the first century marked by struggle and persecution. The perfect Christmas was really not so perfect after all. 
But through all of her trial at the time that the angel Gabriel came upon her, Mary had this to say, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Mary had proactive faith. She did not live in the paralysis of doubt and disillusionment. You see, we need to do the same. A, a person with proactive faith actively pursues God's redemptive purposes and presence in the midst of any situation, even when doing so doesn't seem to make sense. When life isn't making sense, the power of God will be like a shadow over you and me. God is with us. We are favored. And that gift is always, often experienced in pain and suffering. But you see, the good news is this. God never intended for you and me to handle life's unexpected turns by ourselves. That, that's why our life of faith is developed and encouraged within this context of a worshiping community. Before the angel Gabriel left Mary, he named a mentor for her, Mary's cousin Elizabeth. Gabriel said, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. God was leading Mary to someone who had already experienced some of what Mary was going through. In turn, Elizabeth's experience would become the fertilizer of hope and encouragement for Mary's miracle. The wisdom of Elizabeth's years had provided her with a wise, well-traveled faith perspective, which she drew upon to help lead Mary. And likewise, God shows up, and he speaks to us through others who have experienced similar struggles and have come out on the other side. That means your experiences of, of pain and eventually hope can also be the seed of God's miracle in someone else's life. God chose Mary to be the mother of Jesus because he knew that even when life didn't make sense, she would choose to continue serving God. That, that's why God chooses each of you at some time in your life to be a source of comfort and hope to someone else. That's God's miracles at work. You see, life isn't about you and me. We miss life when we use God to get what we desire instead of allowing ourselves to be used by God for God's purposes. So when Christmas comes around during an imperfect season of life and you just don't feel like celebrating, remember, it's not your birthday. It's Jesus' birthday. And by celebrating Christmas, we are celebrating someone else who suffered too. As I end, Michael Slaughter says this, Life is not about staying safe and living comfortably. The call to follow Jesus is a call to give your life to him, to join God's mission in healing the souls of the world. We were never promised a reward in this life. The real rewards are found in the joy and peace that we experience through serving others in Christ's spirit. That is why we can pray with Mary, I am your servant, Lord, regardless of what comes my way. Let it be done to me according to your will, even when the angels disappear. Folks, even in the midst of the unexpected, the messy, and the devastating, you can still fully expect God to show up. No matter what you are struggling to overcome, God promises to show up. This truly is what Christmas is about. Emmanuel, God with us. Lord God, we thank you for showing up in those times of our life when we think we've been deserted. But you are there. Many times it's in other people bringing us food, bringing us comfort, helping us get to a doctor, picking up prescriptions, 
cleaning our homes, decorating our houses. We see you, God, in the service of other people. And so, Lord, we give you thanks this day that you are always there. We just need to open our eyes to the reality that you're there, that you always show up, that you're always with us. And most of all, Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Although it was a messy birth and a time of trial under King Herod, your message still got through. Your Jesus, our salvation, grew into a man. Showed us how to live. Suffered, died, buried, and rose again. That we might have the perfect Christmas with you. And all this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.